I'm Willie Mae MacGyver for Beyond the Praise, and we are here with one of the stars, with one of the innovators behind TV One's hit series, ATL Homicide. It is the man himself, David Quinn. Welcome, David. Thank you for having me. Thank you. It's a pleasure having you here. Oh my gosh, you 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 turned into a celebrity overnight. How about that? Oh wow, that's you're gassing my head now. You know? <laughs> So I know uh, the the you know premise behind the show is solving crimes, but you all solve crimes in a way that that a lot of the television shows in that lane don't. Um, I was just saying that, and like you said, I feel like I'm in the back seat riding shotgun with you all every episode. Um, was that by design? That was entirely by design because me and my brother Vince Velasquez, we met 20 years ago became partners, it was essential that we include the public, the community, the taxpayer in our murder investigations by participation. And if, 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 if we can do pull it off, a member of the family. And you're gonna see that in season three, just like the two previous seasons, we'll use anybody. And we want the viewer to feel like they're with us on the ride. And I do, we do. We feel like we're right, right, right there with you. Um, you mentioned that you all had um, met each other 20 years ago, were partners for 20 years and so forth. How, how did that happen? How Did you all just automatically gel immediately when you started working together or did it develop over time? You know, it was amazing. We both made detective in the year 2000 and we were sent directly to the homicide unit. And homicide, there were veterans that had been there 20 years, you know, taking up space around there. And we were the two young upstarts in our 30s showing up there. And we figured, well, we need to hang out together because I think we see the world the same way. I mean, things had shifted. This wasn't the police department from the 80s or the 70s. It had turned a whole nother side. And so we had a rapport with people in the street and the old guys encumbered us for hot, with hospitality because they just loved the way we worked together. Wow. wow. So you all set a precedent. So uh, were you able to train other detectives on your techniques? I'm sure all of them were like, how are you all doing this? Can we do it too? Well, you know what we called it? We coined the phrase investigative transparency. We shocked everyone when we got to this unit because we would tell the suspects, their grandmama, we would hold court in the living room of some of these houses of our suspects and say, grandmama, this is what we got. And we would show them the whole case. And they were like, why would you all show the people you're going to arrest with the whole case? Me and Vince would say, we want them to try to refute this information, prove us wrong. Let's have court in grandmama house. And then, you know, it'll prepare you for what's coming in the future. Or tell me what really happened out there. And it just it got infectious. And people expected our transparency. And we taped every conversation, even the ones when people would tell us it was somebody else. So you have to live with that as well. Again, investigative transparency. You don't want to get it wrong. We're talking about life sentences for our people. So, you know, we let it all out. You all, tr you were the judge, the jury, the prosecutor, the detectives, everything else rolled up into one. Absolutely. We want you to know what's coming and we want to be fair. And the best way to be fair is to be truthful. Mm -hmm. Prove to me I'm a liar. And, you know, uh, it, it, it just... We, we used everybody in the community and, you know, that no snitch, you know, policy, you hear this in the streets, it's really not true because people have grandmamas and aunties in these marginalized neighborhoods, their own mothers getting on buses every day. Our people, black and brown, want safe neighborhoods. It's not like we uh, endorse the crime that's going on around us. That's just not true. And we try to show that on ATL Homicide every Monday at 9, 8 Central. Wow. Wow, that, that is great. That is great. Another technique that you all use was that you let it play out on television. I mean, you, you your cases or whatever became part of the news. The media became a partner with you all. You know, and that's what's interesting. I don't see that today. I don't see I don't the either. actual detective I don't go either. into the podium. You mm -hmm. can Google on YouTube interviews me and Vince did, press conferences. You can just hit Vince and David press conference. You'll see us actually going to the public, yes. answering questions from the press. It seems like there's some wall up now that law enforcement has, and you only see the administrators out front talking about what happened 
in these taxpayers' neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. They need you have a duty to report the good, the bad, and the ugly. Yes, definitely, definitely. In real time, in real yes. time, not after you solved it, because you can't keep police, you know, from having the media come down to headquarters once they solve the case, right. you know, and do the perp walk. So right. when we're like puzzled, you know, have that full transparency because you're humbling yourself to the process. Mm. So this is season three. You all have gone through, you know, two seasons. How do you select out of the many of gazillion thousands of cases that you all have solved? How do you select the ones for the episodes? Well, what's interesting is all of our homicides don't have a lot of intricacies and in what they call red herring. Some of them are pretty simple. You know, sometimes me and Vince may have stayed at work all night and worked the case with shoe leather and solved it in record time. A lot of times these cases go on for months, like a month is a long time in a homicide investigation. So the studio, our, our uh, production company, they have a catalog of all of our cases and they'll pick from the ones that are more viewer friendly because nobody wants to see something that was solved, you know, in about five minutes. They want to see the process. And so they pick those ones that they think, oh, you know, be better suited for the viewing public. Well, they're picking the right ones. <laughs> so you all are very instrumental in the production of the show. Are you all like executive producers? Are you on set for all the tapings? How does that work? So the way it works, we help build the story content and TV One was so nice as to give us producer credit. I didn't even know what that meant. Okay. You know, but we're actually... So, so what's groundbreaking about our show, to me, you got a black and brown brother talking about police work, in particular, criminal homicide, and we're the narrators. So TV One, they wanted us to speak in our own voices. That was the beauty of this project. Yes. We're telling it like it really happened, and you're hearing it from us straight up. Yeah, amazing concept. Amazing concept that's, that's really working. Is there a particular episode in season three that you can't wait for the viewers to see? Wow, it's, it's just so many. Okay. But, you know, the, there, there's a couple of, the case from last week mm. touched a lot of our viewers because we actually live tweet during the episode in real time. So we interact with the people that are fans of the show. Mm -hmm. Last week's episode was, was, was tremendous in that you know, this was a, a, a person that came over to our country to actually make a change in her life. She came from the Bahamas and you'll see how innocent she was and how she wasn't part of, you know, any kind of crime wave, which people thought in the beginning because of the way she was killed. But Monday night's episode is a parallel. There are actually two homicides that are going to be investigated at the same time, you know, during this particular episode. It's the murder of a guy named Gary Horning and um, uh, a Latin American transplant to our country by the name of Rosendo Urban. And you're gonna see how the paths of these two people that don't know each other come together through criminal homicide. And that's what we call murder, it's a criminal homicide. And you're gonna see this unfold in the in, you know, and this is before technology, this particular episode coming up on Monday. So we gotta use our analog brains on this one and it's, it's really interesting. So um, how do you want viewers to feel after watching, you know, season three or any of the previous seasons? What is it that, what is that takeaway that you want viewers to have when they finish watching a season or a show? What the, the, the big message for me and Vince, it, it's to let the viewer know you're a part of the process. Should you become a victim of a crime, you know, or God forbid a family member of yours is killed, you are part of the process. You shouldn't be shielded from an ongoing investigation. It's not that deep. You know, sometimes, you know, Cain killed Abel. It's just that simple. Tell the viewer, tell the, the, the grieving, people grieve forever. And we want them to know there's a process. Just to share something personal with you, my own son was shot in October of, of 2000 during the height of the pandemic. I mean, this is when we weren't even sure if we were wearing masks or not. And I remember going out to the scene, I got a call middle of the night and everybody behind the yellow tape thought I was responding to do work. You know, I'm retired. Yeah. A baby boy got shot three times. Oh, and so this, this kind of 
you know, it was really serious injuries. He's still battling back. There's a lot to that. But my, my point is the police department, it wasn't Atlanta, it was a Metro Atlanta police department. They gave me awful service. And everybody in town know who I, they thought I was coming to work to murder. They give black and brown people horrible service across this country, especially when your loved one survives. It's almost like, well, he survived. He just got shot three times and they move it on if there's no clues there. So I had to hold their feet to the fire and it's still going on. That building is gonna to have to burn down until I get my answers. They didn't solve the case. They're never gonna solve it, but I wanna get some change in the way people perceive our people, the black and brown people. Gun violence is an epidemic right now in our country. And a lot of times the survivors of gun violence are put on the back burner. And I wanna, I wanna give voice in, you know, to, to that struggle right now. So we wow. address it as our own personal pandemic, gun violence in these black and brown communities. Wow, wow. You know, that, that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother show in itself, isn't it? <laughs> that's a whole nother show that you all can do. And it's, especially with you kind of leading the charge for it because some, somebody yeah. needs to pick up that mantle and run with it. No doubt. And we got to recognize as a people, we have our own pandemic. You know, uh, there's talks now that this may be something the CDC needs to look into. We're dying at alarming rates in these really popular cities like Atlanta, Chicago, D.C., Baltimore. You know, that's a public health crisis. It is. That, that bullet is our virus. It's killing us off. And we need to deal with it because what, what, what they've used before hasn't worked. You know, more police, you know, more mechanized police. That doesn't work. We got to study and look at this thing from a different perspective. And I hope to be a voice, you know, in that surge towards whatever our new truth is going to be. I'm sure you will be. I, I'm sure you will be. Well, we, we are just so excited about, you know, ATL homicide. I don't know. What, what's next for you? What else are you working on? Are you working on um, anything else? Well, sister, I'm working on retirement. Ah! And retirement for me is doing anything that doesn't involve handcuffing humans. You know what I mean? So I'm fully retired, but I, I, I'm an amateur writer. So I'm, yeah, I'm trying to get a book deal, straight up. I'm trying to get a book. There's one I'm working on. And uh, I want people to see the nuts and bolts of what really goes on uh, in these investigations. And I'm going to share some thoughtful you know, life experiences through some of these crimes I've investigated and how they cross over into my personal life. So I want to come back on when I get my deal because I'm hoping oh, yeah. I'm your literary agent. <laughs> I want to come hang deal. out with you and tell uh, people how to get the book. You're going to definitely get that deal. Did want to ask you briefly about the two young men who play you all in the series. Oh, wow. They do an amazing job as well. You know, season three, Angelo Diaz, and, you know, Angelo Diaz and Christopher Diaz, they are David and Vince. They, <laughs> they, they're, they're us personified. I, I'm looking at the nuance. And these are professional actors. These, they didn't just walk in at the cornfields. These guys have been working and they're great actors. And we're humbled. We're humbled by what they're doing, depicting us in our 30s as we approach our 60s now. So, you know, it's, it's really a compliment and a kiss on the forehead from these two guys. Were you all um, a part of the process uh, of the auditions to get them? Actually, we weren't, but we met them as soon as they got the job, had dinner uh, down at corporate headquarters for the production company in Tennessee. We met them and we became instant family. So we love both of those brothers and we, we, we know they're going to have beautiful careers beyond ATL Homicide one day. Yeah, yeah. With all the cases and everything that that you all had to, to solve and were a part of. How does that, how does that attack you mentally, physically, emotionally? How do you separate the job from your personal life or can you? What's interesting, what's interesting sister is that I became a police officer two years after high school. And so at 20 years old, I was given a badge and gun and I was sent to these quote unquote marginalized neighborhoods, the projects, and that's where I stayed, you know, for like the first 15 years. I didn't make detective until 15 years. So I had a wife, I have a wife, <laughs> for 30 years, we raised six children. And so I really didn't have time to think about what was going on because 
the police work was my life. It was interesting. It really was. I didn't know anything. I didn't have any high. I didn't shoot pool. I mean, we went to church. We had our children. We it was always busy. Soccer, football, basketball. And so now I'm, I'm able to sit back and let some of this stuff wash over me. I'm a lot more sensitive than I used to be. Um, I was always sensitive with my victims' families. You know, those, you, know you always want to hug the mother, grandmother, father that's experiencing the loss and, and, and get that pain on you so you can go fight for them in those streets. And so now as I sit back, I'm like, God kept me because I never have had bad dreams. I've never, I just thought, I thought I was working for God. I mean, wow. I hate to get, get all, you know, uh, emotional with you, but, you know, God uses his people. We're yeah. his tools. And I was, a, you know, God put me out there because I loved it. I love serving these people. It was always them first. Uh, they still call me to this day on birthdays of their loved ones lost. On the holidays, I go to their homes. Oh. It was biblical. The whole process was beautiful, even though it was about the, the ultimate tragedy. Well, it, you know what? That was your calling. You were just working your calling. I think you're right. I think you're right. You were. You were. Oh, my gosh. It has been such a pleasure speaking with you and getting to, to know you. Um, I feel like I already know you from the show. because, Like I said, it's one of my Absolutely. favorites. But just to hear you as a person and kind of to hear everything that you went through to get to where you are now, it's, it, it's an amazing story. And I'm looking forward to that book. You got to write that book. Yeah, I'm doing it. I'm, I'm about 70,000 words in, so I'm, I'm coming down the downslope. So I'm almost finished. Uh, it's pretty raw. You know, you're going to have to like, you know, take a shower afterwards, but uh, it's, <laughs> I'm not holding anything back. I'm just letting it out. Any words of encouragement for detectives right now, homicide detectives who may be listening or viewing this interview? I would say homicide detectives, law enforcement in general, the homicide does not belong to the police department. It mm -hmm. belongs to the community that you serve. And it belongs to the families left behind. And uh, if you humble yourself and you win one street, one neighborhood at a time, you're not going to have anything but success. You're just not going to. You got to love the people you work for. One neighborhood at a time. I like that. That's, that's a it. slogan. Awesome. Let's use it. Let's, let's <laughs> hashtag it. <laughs> yes, hashtag. Right, right. No Thanks doubt. again, David. Continue success in all that you do. And please keep in touch with us. Thank you for having me. Uh, you're an amazing interviewer. Thank oh, you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. We've been speaking with David Quinn of ATL Homicide TV One, Monday nights, 9 Eastern. Don't miss it. I'm Willie Mae McIver for Beyond the Praise.